How is everyone today? I didn't plan on talking today, but I may as well. Can you guys hear me okay? May as well. People always have questions for me. Don't understand it. How you doing, Pastor Scott? Thank you for coming on at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That was wonderful. That was great. That was a wondrous, great thing. You know what, folks? It seems to be a lot of people following suit with the topics of COT. In other words, the Spirit is expressing some interesting things to its to the people who believe in Jesus Christ. You know what I think? There's a clear message in the words that are being given by those who do love the Lord, and it is this. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't think you know the end of this story. Don't be deceived and don't think you know the end. A great many people who are acquainted with the darkness of this world very few of them find their way out of the world and um, it's really darker than you can imagine it's not something you preoccupy your mind with certainly something you need to uh, understand you need to know that it does exist but we are in fact overcomers we are overcomers remember you're a lamp where do you put a lamp in order for a lamp to be effective and to be utilized, it must be placed in the darkness to illuminate that darkness. That's where a lamp is placed. See, when a lamp is off in the daytime, you can only say, oh, that's a beautiful lamp. That's it. You see, it's external beauty. But when the lamp is turned on at night, you say, how useful is this? This is very useful. And remember this, no darkness can penetrate light. However, light can penetrate any darkness. Remember that. You're made to be placed in the world. This world is darkness to illuminate a light. And people see that light. Whether you recognize that or not, they see it. They can't help but to see it. It's visible from miles away. From a great distance, they can see your light. Together, we provide a sanctuary of light for a lot of people because through us, the Father does work. It just so happens that a great many things men have again transgressed the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every time they do this, The Lord's wrath begins to build again and build. Have you noticed the pattern of the Lord that the wrath of the Lord is it never comes early in the corruption of the world? It never comes early, it never comes in the middle of the corruption of the world. It always comes in the end of that corruption, always. What a great many people don't know is that prior to the flood, the Lord had sent vessels among vessels out to the world. But you know what? The wise in the world those days knew that the flood was coming. They knew it was coming. They knew it was coming because men were transgressing the law that was given to Adam, which was to be fruitful and multiply. You see, what you may not know about pre-flood history is that it was just like today, vanity ruled the order of the day. Women did not want to get pregnant because it altered their physical appearance. They didn't want to get pregnant. Then on top of that, the 200 that fell on Mount Hermon made things worse. They used to give women a beverage that would cause them to be barren. They knew how to make things that would cause people not to have children. And the women wanted to keep their shape rather than have a child. But the Lord said, be fruitful and multiply. You see, men have a way of transgressing anything that God says. Near the end of the thing. And it's growing. 
It's growing. Even right now, the transgressions are growing. You see, we're dealing with a multifaceted issue here. Not only are people going against everything that the Lord said, everything that Jesus said they're going against, but they're adding abominations to it. And you see, just like the days of Noah, they began to laugh at those who kept the law, who kept the words of the Lord, who knew the ways of the Lord and kept them. They began to laugh at them, saying, of what good are you doing that? That's yielding no good to you. Even Enoch, bless his heart, when he walked the earth, kings came to him. Did you know there was peace on earth the whole time Enoch walked the face of this earth for 200 plus years? They came to him looking for wisdom. He had the wisdom of God with him. They wanted to be under his covering, and they had peace in the earth at that time. But you see, the leaders of the world are different now. The leaders are not submitting to the Father. At that time, kings were submitting to the Father, but the rest of the world was still cutting out. There was only 250 years of a tight peace. Then, of course, Noah came and the stench of the world had already ascended. And you know what? It's ascending now. It's ascending. Because so many were killed wrongfully back in the time of Noah and Enoch. The blood of the earth did cry out. That was right after Cain was killed by Tubal Cain. That's a long story anyway. But that same process is happening right now in its building. My hope here is that you can be educated enough in the words of the Lord, not my words, not men's theology, not to be carried to and fro by doctrines in this world. The time for that is ending. It's ending. That should be no more. There are scriptures about men, men being carried to and fro by doctrine, running here and there, hearing different doctrines. They did that because they had no root. The root that everybody seeks is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the new wine. You know what Jesus in his time told them straight to their faces. Here's what happened when Jesus was here. Every time Jesus said something, they reminded him of the law. Jesus was told them he fulfilled the law. But they began to remind him of the law. Then he turned and looked to those that would believe and said, you cannot put new wine and old wineskins. You can't do it. The new wine being the gospel of Jesus Christ, the old wine being the law. Both were wine. One superseded the other. They couldn't accept the new wine, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the new wine was. People often have a question about the new wine and the old wine. But the new wine is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He used that term more than once. He gave an example of it. Still today, there are a great many people who will begin to oppress other people, telling them to abstain from meats, not to marry, and a host of other things, telling men to do the opposite of what God told them to do. You know, there's a scripture about the meats also. Just about the meat, about how men for doing these things. It's a sad thing, really, but a great many people will be carried away by that. They'll be carried away by that. The actual message, the actual message is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But it just so happens we're entering a time when the scoffers, through their pressure, those being used by demons, that's what a scoffer is. There's one thing about a scoffer people have to realize, is that that individual is not scoffing on their own. But instead of resisting the devil, they entertained him. They entertained him enough that the devil took hold of them. 
Now they're thinking they do God a service by getting rid of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have a form of godliness, but they, they deny the power thereof. That's what they do. They're traitors. You know what is so funny? Because in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it describes these people. It describes them. It describes the, the very nature of people that live these days. I don't have my Bible with me, but if I remember correctly, it says that men will be lovers of themselves, covetous, they'll want everything everybody else has, boasters, they will begin to boast about their accomplishments in contrast to those at the whim of other things. They'll really be proud, blasphemers, they'll speak horrible things against the Most High God and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. These same individuals are disobedient to parents, and they justify it. They're unthankful because they always want more. They're never content with what they're given. They never give thanks for what they're given. They always set their eyes to want more. They are, in fact, false accusers. They'll do anything to get you out of the way. That the word of God will not prosper in this world. And they will not like you. In fact, anybody that does good and works out of the realm of love, they won't like them. That's in Second Timothy chapter 3. These are the ones that have a form of godliness. But they deny the power thereof. And you know what they do? As I told you guys last week, they sneak into chat rooms, into ministries. They get to know everybody real good. Then they go behind people's back and contact them. They give little sly messages. Let me, let me explain something to you. Good, peaceful, holy conversation does not have to be done in secret. It doesn't. If someone is contacting you, behind the backs of everybody else and they think they're saving you, right? Yet, they discourage somebody else in doing so. These people are agents of Satan. Satan has them at that time. It does not mean they're bad people. Don't ever point at the person. But spirits are working. Most people who do that have been hurt in their lives. You see, they've been hurt. But the one thing they never did to say, Lord, please heal me from this hurt. The enemy tricks them into thinking that if they love again, they'll be hurt again. This is the devil's words. That's what the enemy does. He tells them, never love again, or you'll be hurt again. The Bible says to love your enemies. Satan says, don't do it. You know what? These people are going to multiply in the body of Christ. I'm forewarning you. I'm giving you a warning. I gave you a warning last Sunday, remember? About these same individuals who do this. They're not going to stop. You see, but you have a power over them. You know what that's called? You guys exercise this power every day. It's something that's within you that can overcome the vices of the enemy. You know what that is? Love. Love. Love, love, love. I'm going to share something with you guys. The Holy Spirit can tell you a great many things, but it's up to us to listen. The Holy Spirit can urge you to do a great many things, but it's up to us to act. You see, if we don't act or listen to the truth coming in us, it won't be conveyed. But if we let love flow, it is our weapon. When you engage in a conversation, the enemy always tells on himself by challenging you in Scripture. This is the way he does. He'll challenge you in Scripture. He'll ask these strange little questions. 
And by the way, it doesn't mean the person is bad of which these things come through. We're all learning to resist the devil in many different areas. Resisting the devil may be far different than what you thought. It's not as straightforward as you thought. You see, the devil can give you an inkling to say, oh, try this person, test him with a scripture. The devil can do that. God doesn't do that. But the devil can. You have to resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have to resist him in your thoughts. Take captive your thoughts. You have to resist him in your imaginations. Cast down imaginations. You have to resist him in your flesh. Die to your flesh daily. You have to resist him. We really do have to learn to return evil with love. If you return evil with love, it really is like heaping coals upon the enemy's heads. That means it's going to burn them. It's hot. Can you imagine dumping hot coals on somebody's head? Imagine that picture. Not only will they have spots and missing hair fragments on their head, right? But they're going to look pretty rough. That's what love does to the enemy. So you've had the weapon all along and the enemy has been trying to trick you into not using it. That's what he's been doing. Most of the devices used in your life are to trick you from not conveying love, from not using love. The target has been against love. Love is the power that holds this universe together. Love is what he stops from flowing through you. He'll do anything to do it. But listen, you need to understand he's lost. He's already lost the battle. You see, the whole process is finished in the first place. From start to, to the end. It's finished. It's already done. It's done. But because we have our own sovereign will, the Father won't interrupt our will. It's up to us to make choices every single day. To stay in the steps that he walked before us. I've learned through my life that staying in love is a place where there are no regrets. There's no actual pain in love itself. It's only uncomfortable because we look around and we see things that scare us. But the key word is we look around at things that scare us. He cannot handle you if you stay in that realm of love. You know what, to be honest with you, this is why it's really bad to do things that alter your mental state, like getting drunk. If, you, if you're drunk, you're off your character. That's what happens when you're drunk. Even the Bible explains that. It told people they can, you can drink wine, just don't drink to the point of drunkenness. And the reason why is because you're out of your character when you're drunk. A great many people have been drunk. They know what being out of the character is. You throw caution to the wind. You begin to act out of the flesh. Then you wake up the next day and say, oh, no, I, did I really do that? You're acting out of your flesh when you get drunk. You let your guard down. These are days where we have to stay sober in all things. We really do. The enemy is really lurking around. But I'm telling you right now, he's going to sow a lot of thorns in every single ministry. These thorns, he has sown a lot of thorns in the ministry. These thorns are growing up. And the first thing they do is they attempt to divide people. I tell everybody in COTs, I'm telling you today, if you know people who are trying to divide you, you need to first let them know that they are loved. And just ask them nicely to go about your way. You know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us, from such, from such, turn away. These traitors, high-minded folks, lovers of self more than God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. I believe that's 2 Timothy um, verse 4. Turn away from those folks. They lower you in. You see, they'll speak against the love of God. And do you know what their whole op uh, modus operandi is? They want power. They seek power. They want to be the influence over people. 
All they had to do in the first place was speak scripturally. That's all they had to do from the New Testament. But a great many of them speak from the what? The Old Testament. They do. They speak from the Old Testament. And they cause a lot of guilt. Jesus, when Jesus came, the word was given through love. When the Old Testament was here, there was a lot of fear involved. They want people back under that fear. That's what they want. They want people under that fear. They need that power to continue. But you see, here's the problem. When love was introduced to the world, the war began once again. See, when Jesus came, he freed all those who were in bondage of the law. Do you think the Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, and the lawyers like that? No, they didn't. You see, because people no longer had to go to them. That was the problem. See, these people who want power, they're okay, so long as you have to go to them to make the big decisions. But when someone comes and says, hey, you can go directly to Jesus Christ. You can go boldly to the throne. You can go right into the holies of holies. The holy of holies, without their permission, the Sadducees and Pharisees of this world, they do not like that. Think of their character. Listen to me. Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes and lawyers. These are the ones that were against Jesus Christ. Do you not know we have these same people today? Sadducee and Pharisee, what did they do? They interpreted the law for the people. That's what they did. They were also able to impose the penalty upon people. They spoke curses based off the Old Testament on people. This is what they did. They spoke curses. Then you have your scribes, those smart people who document everything. They had a problem with Jesus too. Because what he was speaking, they could not find in the scriptures. Thus, it was false. See, if they couldn't find something in the scriptures, it was false to them. Jesus was that new wine. Then you have your lawyers. Your lawyers appear to speak on the behalf of the innocent. Yet they always served the Sadducees and Pharisees out of fear. If a lawyer at that time ever defended anybody against the Sadducees and Pharisees, the lawyer would die under penalty of the law. So you see, it's about power. When Jesus came, the enemy lost his power. He lost his power. Lost it all. And he didn't like it. But guess what? The Bible says he will make your enemy your footstool. When they crucified him, that was necessary. They became, they, they, they were his footstool. All the people that wronged you in your life, they were your footstool too. All these great people who attacked COT, they were our footstool. They were. Everything the enemy uses to destroy something is used as a footstool. That's why it's written, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It's because if the enemy means harm against you by any means, it's going to be used to elevate you and to train you, to raise you up in the word of God. That's why it means that. Sickness is the same way. All of it. How else would you have trials and tribulations if the Lord did not allow Satan to come into your life and wreak a little havoc so that you would learn to overcome? You're an overcomer, by the way. I want you guys to know that. Despite the world tells you you're an overcomer. You are. But there are spies in the land. Again, there are spies in the land. Spies in the land. They're at your they're at your home. They'll listen to you only to get enough information to tear you down. You see, the war is against your soul. That's why this time is different than any other time before it. It's very different. My hope is that you all can stand in those places where at one point you thought you couldn't stand. But your fight is not against a person. 
it truly is against principalities and powers. See, the enemy wants you to point at a person. It's very late. It's very late in time. If he can get you to point at a person, he know you. He knows for a fact, by God's own admission, that you have to endure the same measure of which you judged. So yes, he's going to try and get you to point at the President of the United States, people overseas. He wants you to call everybody and anybody the Antichrist so that everybody and anybody will point at you and say you're a false witness. You see, Satan is on his game. He knows that if you judge anybody, you're going to be judged with that same measure. So he tries to lure you into doing these things to get you outside of the realm of love. First of all, if you truly do love your enemy as yourself, you'll never judge them. You'll be hopeful for them. See, anything you love, you want to help. And anything you want to help, you have a hope for. He doesn't like that. He despises the fact that I talk to you all. Despises despises but you know what I'm, I'm gonna give you an example how many people thought honestly how many people thought Bush and Bill Clinton and Bush singer were the Antichrist how many people how many people what they didn't realize was when they were making those false accusations they became an accuser of the brethren who are your brethren everybody but you you see, Satan lures people in to make them the accuser of the brethren. When they judge like that, and they're wrong, then all I can say is God help them. God help them. Because if we judge them we're wrong, we're going to be judged in that like manner. And yes, it will have an effect. It'll have an effect. You guys won't hear me. A lot of people will ask me about the Pope. Well, it looks like me when I wake up in the morning. A lot of people will ask me about the Pope. They'll ask me about Obama. They'll ask me about a great many figures. And I have no comment on them. I have no comment. I have no comment because I'm not going to go that route. We war not against the flesh. We war against principalities and powers. Here's something you should know. It does not matter who's president. The same principality is over this kingdom in the United States. It does not matter who the president is going to be. The same principality is in effect. That's what we should. You know what? When it comes to the beast itself, the beast never talks about a specific person. Now, remember, in Revelation, there are two beasts. Two beasts. Remember the beast that came out of the waters, right? And it was said that the waters were the many people of earth. Hmm, isn't that something? Anyway, the beast, these are countries, countries. The beast constitutes countries. There's a principality over every country, every county, every city, whatever. It's a principality over that. This is why you can go from one state to the other and you feel different. You can go from one county to the other and you feel different. You can sense a spirit change every place you go. It's also why you can step into one person's house and feel absolute freedom. Go into another person's house and you feel like you're in chains. There's a principality and power at work. It's important that you understand that. You don't, you're not here to war against humanity. You see, your weapons of warfare are spiritual only. You guys understand that? Your weapons of warfare are spiritual because you're not warring against the flesh. You're fighting against those things in the spirit. Now, understand me on this. What is in the spiritual realm can come into this realm in full manifestation. To the average person, guns won't work against it or anything else, and it can utterly destroy that person. 
You are the ones who are armed against them. You are the ones. You see, because it is still a principality in power, whether it manifests in full or not, it's a principality in power. You are armed to do battle. These things want to do battle. They want to do battle. But don't ever forget, these things are subject unto you through the name of Jesus Christ. In fact, according to the word itself, many people who were not with Jesus Christ and will be sent to hell will cast out demons by the power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Are you guys aware of that? This is why it was written, it says, uh, all those who say, Lord, Lord, are not with me. Some people will get up there and say, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Yep. Didn't we do this in your name? Yep. Depart from me, you work of iniquity. I never knew you. You know what? It tells you why those people will be cast out too, which is so sad because I see them every day. I see them every day. I can hear the words. They've already figured out in their minds what everything is going to be like. They can no longer hear from the Spirit because they already have their own answers. God help them. God help them. Things will begin to multiply, but so will the supernatural things of the world. They will begin to multiply. This is why I'm in the book of Revelation. <laughs> Because I tell you, I'm going to have to say it again. I believe exactly what the Lord had written in this book. I believe it. I'm not going to attempt to reorder it. I'm not going to attempt to interpret it. But we'll take it line by line, precept upon precept, and learn God's word as God gave it. As I shared with you before, the Lord gives me dreams. He never gave me a dream out of order. The Old Testament, when I'm reading the Old Testament, he didn't inspire that to be written out of order. He didn't do it. The old prophecies that pertained to the coming of Jesus Christ, they too were in order. They were. But I can't, listen, I'm, I'm not a theologian. I'm not an expert in men's minds. So I have to read it just as the word gave it. You see, that's my security. If the Lord gave it and it was not in the order it was written, then he'll reveal that in its timing. But it's important for us to know the events that happen in there. So far, so far, um, yeah, everything is going on as uh, just like it was written. It was. I noticed, I did a little history on the book of Revelation. And this is, I have to say this. When it was first documented, right, in the 1200s, this is where they began to say, oh, the end is here. Because this happened and this happened and there's the end. Nothing happened in the 1200s. Right? They said Jesus was coming back definitively in the 1200s. Well, they kept doing this every 10 years. Every 10 years. In somebody's mind, Jesus was coming back, and they used the book of Revelation to prove it. But I wanted to know, how were they coming up with this? And when you know it, they reordered Revelation. In every single case, they reordered Revelation all the way up until the end. They reordered Revelation. See, there are key words in Revelation that no one can dispute. No one can dispute. First of all, it'll say, and after, and after he opened the, uh, and, and no, listen, when he had opened the seventh seal, this or that happened. And then this would happen and that would happen. And after those things happened, this would happen. You know, when you keep uh, reading that like that. And people begin to put it in their own order. They'll begin to 
call for something that can't be called because they didn't use patience. Now, I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm not saying I'm right either. But I have to read it just how God gave it. There are a great many people who believe that revelation is not in order. Right? I'm not saying they're wrong. It could be. But I have to read it just as God gave it to John. So I'm going to learn it this way. I just opt to learn it this way. And a great many people have, have already told me, well, it makes no sense if you read it uh, from front to the ending, but to me it does. It really does make sense. It really does. It makes sense. I think what confuses people, there are parts in Revelation that confuses people, right? For one, for one, you have to tackle things like Things come out of the bottomless pit and attack everybody who doesn't have the seal of uh, God on their foreheads, right? Well, if they come out of the pit and attack everybody who does not have the seal of God on their foreheads, they're wondering, well, who are those people? But see, if you read the entire book, first from ending, it makes perfect sense. Before any trouble, the Lord prepares his people. He prepared the 144,000. I'm not one of them, the 144,000, because I'm... It's a lot of us that are not one of the 144,000. They're virgins. They're described in Revelation 14. You know what? The Bible tells us exactly what he's talking about in every single situation. But I'm not one to lean unto my own understanding. That's why I read it line by line. The Lord may have gave the absolute truth to someone. Right? About the whole book. He didn't give it to me that way, so I have to read it line by line. Now, I told you before, I believe your word blindly. A lot of people said, oh, things are metaphorical in Revelation. That's what they say, things are metaphorical. I have not found not one metaphorical thing in the book of Revelation. I really haven't. I've not found anything metaphorical. They said the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns and ten crowns, that was metaphorical, except the book of Daniel explains it. And then later on in Revelation, it explains it. You know, it could have been metaphorical had they left it alone, but it, they explained it. You know, I'll be honest with you, I'm not even concerned about who the Antichrist is. I'm not concerned. Why would I be concerned about who the Antichrist is? When the Lord already said that man in perdition will be revealed. After there's a great falling away. So before we look for the Antichrist, we need to understand there will be a great falling away first. Before he's revealed. Right? See, everybody's looking for the beast. But they're denying that there's going to be a great falling away. You know what a great falling away is? Many people will turn from the faith. Their hearts will grow cold. You know if that happens, the scoffers are going to multiply by the thousands. So guess what? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not concerned about who the Antichrist is. I'm concerned about walking in the steps that prescribed the way of life that Jesus set before us. These are very delusional and deceiving times. If I get focused on something afar off, then I have no time to focus on what's happening right now. It's like this. Think of yourself. You're on the top of a mountain that has a cliff. Way in the distance, you can hear a thousand cries. Right? And then someone taps your head and says, Hey, I know you hear those cries out there, but look ten feet below your feet. There's somebody hanging off the cliff and they're about to die. If you're focused on something in the distance, you cannot see what's happening right now. That's why I trust the word of God. And I do not trust the words of men. I love the hearts of many. But you see, I have to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ myself. I'm not here to convince you of any doctrine or anything. I'm here to tell you that the gospel is real. It's true. But you're right. There are a great many people caught up on who the Antichrist is. They're so caught up that there's been an Antichrist every American election. Somebody was the Antichrist. Every single one. You know, I read the prophecies about Barack Obama. According to the Muslims, you know what it said? It did say that a tall black man in the West 
would be the last president before the Mahdi rose. That means at the end of his term, the Mahdi will certainly rise, but this tall black figure would unknowingly assist in setting the groundwork for the Mahdi. The Mahdi, in their religion, has the exact same characteristics as the Antichrist in our religion. The Mahdi comes from Iran. That's where he comes from, in Iran. Probably from one of those pits of which green smoke comes out. And it's not sulfur. It'll, it'll just make you sick and you'll begin to... Uh, most people go into a daze when they start getting nearing these holes. And those holes are real. But see, in the book of Daniel, it said, Four kings will rise in Persia, yea, the fourth shall be far richer than them all. And through him the abomination of desolation will be set up, and through him oblation will cease. He is that man of perdition. But there again, I read and believe the word of God just as it is written. I found that uh, people have theorized too many things about the word of God. I can't do that. They can do it. I'm terrified to do it. I really am. I'm terrified to do it. So I can't do that. I'm just letting you know I can't do that. If you ever want to know where I stand in the word of God, it is for the word of God. I'm not going to add to it or take away. I, me personally, I can't do it. I just can't do it. There are a great many people out there who have, uh, they, they're probably right on certain things, but guess what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going that route because I was talking to Angela earlier today and, uh, you know, we were just talking, but I told her if I suspect something is wrong in any way, I am not going to do it. I just simply won't do it. I won't touch it. As Larry would say, I'm not touching that. But see, those things that I do know, like the true authority and power in love itself, I'll tell you about that all day. That can help you right now. But I don't get into disputes about Revelation. But I will share with you what's written in the Bible. And I, I'm, I'm going to say it again. They could be right. It could be overlapped on top of each other. I'm just telling you, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm going to read it as it's written. I'm not going to change one jot or one tittle. I'm not going to take away or add to it. I'm not going to do that. Because it specifically said those who add to the book of Revelation, he'll add to them the plagues that are in the book. Those who take away from it, they'll take away their portion. It, that's not going to happen to me. So I'm not going to do it. Now, for those of you who do read it with me in its context, to me, I'm telling you again, it makes perfect sense. It makes absolute sense. It really does make perfect sense. Perfect sense. You know what? Especially the trumpets I can see. I've seen the simulation process of Revelation and the trumpets. I've seen that. I can see it so clearly happening, just like he wrote. And those uh, little things that come out of the ground, you remember in the book of Joel, it said the locust, the palmer worm, it was another bug. He said, my army that I sent among you, amongst you. He specifically mentioned the locust, the palmer worm, and another insect as his army. He did. Now, I know a lot of people theorize of what those are, but here's what they don't know. People have actually mixed genetic DNA, ancient DNA, with new DNA, and there exists underground. They normally don't let them multiply eight-foot-tall praying mantises mixed with other DNA. Now, what would you do if you saw an eight-foot-tall praying mantis? What would you do? What would you do if you saw a human mixed with praying mantis DNA. And I'm telling you, the reason why they mixed human DNA with insect DNA was so that they would be naturally armored. Naturally armored. The armor, I had visually seen one of the legs of these experiments, and you cannot shoot through it. You cannot. 
It's just not going to happen. Plus, with an insect, you have to remember, you can take a leg off of an insect and it doesn't hurt the insect because they don't have nerve endings like we do. The insect still keeps going along about his day. He still keeps going. If you mixed human DNA and it had the brains of a human mixed with an insect and you shot it up to pieces, it's not going to kill the insect because they don't have a nervous system like we do. They don't feel pain like we do. They just don't do it. But you know what? That's reserved for the world. And listen to this. In the sixth seal, the world was accounted for. One third was killed. Two thirds did not repent. And the only people that were here during that time were who? The 144,000 that were sealed. See, nobody can figure out the 144,000. This is why Revelation gets mixed up with a lot of people. See, I believe what was written. And here's what's written. In chapter 7 of Revelation, when the four angels hold back the four winds, the 144,000 are sealed. But then John notices a number that no man can number, which came out of great tribulation. They're gone. They came out of great tribulation. You see, if you discount that great number of people who came out of great tribulation, who are, by the way, with the Lamb, they're with the Lamb. They're no longer in this world. They're with the Lamb. They're no longer in this world. They're with the Lamb. The 144,000 are the only ones that are here that are good people. The rest are bad people. But you see, nobody can understand that because it specifically says, these are they which came out of great tribulation. This is what messes people up. All of this happens in the sixth seal, by the way. Then a person may ask themselves, what tribulation? Well, we're given a premise and a sign. It said great tribulation. They come out of great tribulation. What great tribulation? Well, what are our markers? In the sixth seal, we have the sky rolling together. The moon turning his blood, the stars falling to earth. And sure enough, in, in, in Matthew 24, we can see it. Because Jesus said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon will not give her light. Stars are going to fall to earth and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Jesus explained it. But nobody wants to believe it. You know why? Because the rapture doctrine crept into the church. And has messed up Revelation for what it really is. They've messed it up. That's what they did. Even a theologian should know that the occupants of Israel have to go through the entire thing. Who are we? The Gentiles. What are we grafted into the branch? But they know that the occupants of Israel must endure the whole thing until Jesus comes again. This is what had, this has crept into the church. And it's, listen, the rapture is a doctrine given by a guy who was riding a horse, fell off the horse, hit his head on a rock and had a dream of a wedding, woke up and talking about the rapture. In fact, 10 years after he had that dream, after he hit his head on a rock, he said Jesus was coming back and he was wrong. And you know what the Bible says? If somebody says something, if a prophet says something, it does not come to pass. Don't trust that prophet. This guy said it not once, but about four times and then he died. But the rapture doctrine stuck around. It was picked up and carried on throughout generations. This is what people don't understand. Then people argue, well, it says we're going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. Go, go read Daniel. Go read the book of Daniel. The angel gave him that dream concerning his people, Israel. They will be the ones that will stand there. And Michael, who is the prince of Israel, of that land, will stand up in that day. Those who are alive at that time will be changed. But that happens in Israel. It happens in Israel. That's why the word said you have to rightly divine the word of truth. Because there are certain parts that don't apply. They apply directly to Israel. Now, you know what? A lot of people say, no, the whole Bible applies to everybody. 
Most of it does, yes, in a way. But when a dream is given specifically to Daniel for his people and his people only, and then you read in Revelation, which confirms that a great many people came out of great tribulation. But then you understand through Revelation that the occupants of Israel are still there. Boy, doesn't that confirm the fact? But everybody wants to skip over that. And so you know what? They're going to be caught unaware. Because they're looking for something that's not there. You know what, Black Hand, a lot of people thought that until, guess what? Until something else happened. You know what? That's called the Holocaust. If spiritual Israel was just spiritual Israel, then the Holocaust would have happened all over the world, and it didn't. It did not happen all over the world. It happened to the Jews. You see, that was written in the Bible also. They misinterpreted that, saying, well, no, that's for the whole world. No, it wasn't. It was for the Jews. You see, this is the dangerous territory and assumptions. I have to believe what God wrote. God said, I'm going to tell you the dream concerning your people, Daniel. And so I have to believe that. You know what? If we say spiritual Israel, then the abomination and desolation can be all over the world. Then the temple could be in any nation. If we believe that they're talking about spiritual Israel. This is why we do the we did the study of Daniel, which gave a great many people some insight. See, in order to understand Revelation, you have to know the book of Daniel. In order to understand Daniel, I have to know parts of Isaiah. But importantly, the book of Daniel tells you who is who. This is what has caused confusion in the church. That's what caused it, because of the rapture doctrine. And again, the guy who thought up the rapture was riding on a horse. He fell off the horse and hit his head. He woke, he saw a wedding. He said that was a rapture. This same guy, five years, I think it was five years later said that Jesus was coming back and everybody sold all their stuff and nothing happened. Then five years after that, he did the same thing and nothing happened. Then he did it again and nothing happened and he died. Yes, he fell off the horse and hit his head on a rock. I guess it bothers me because you know what's going to happen? A lot of people, when they're still here, like they were in the Holocaust, my grandmother told me, a lot about the Holocaust. In fact, she told me about the people that were in the Holocaust saying, no, this is not what God means. God means this. That's what they were saying. That's not what God means. That's not what the word is saying. The Torah doesn't say that. The Torah says this. Here's what it really means. These same people were saying, here's what it really means. And then the Holocaust happened. You see, the Holocaust happened. Why did the Holocaust just happen for the Jews? Why didn't it happen for the whole world? Nobody ever touches the Holocaust in Scripture. It's in Scripture. Even down to their heads being shaved bald, being burnt to stubble. And then, of course, they'd be scattered among all nations and called back home and Israel would be a nation. That was in the Bible, but everybody ignored it because they already had the answer. I'll tell you again. I read the word as it is written. I found that the word needs no interpretation, but that the word interprets itself. And for the things we really cannot understand, God gives revelation. I keep an humble heart because if I'm wrong about anything in my thoughts, which I keep in my head, well, then I didn't lead anybody astray, but I'm not going to be responsible for leading anybody astray. So I give them exactly what the word says. Not what I say, but what the word says. Within the word are great details that people often look over. They do. They look over. I don't look them over. I'm nosy about the word of God. I want to know how things are tied into each other. But I find it based on scripture, not Michael's theories. Not my theories. Because, you know, I wonder, too, everybody's going to be changed in a twinkling of an eye. And then in Daniel, I read it where everybody was changed in a twinkling of an eye. I said, oh, there it is. But I said, what happened to the rest of the people? That let me down a road to find the information. That's what it did. Part after part, precept upon precept, I learned it just as God gave it. 
And I found out, I said, you know what, from now on, I'm going to just read it how God gave it. God can give the revelation. But let me certainly get it into my spirit, his word of truth. He'll demonstrate the rest. He'll demonstrate the rest. So, you know, a lot of people have theories and so forth, but I'm just telling you that I have to go with what is written in the scriptures. I, I can't make up a theory. To me, that's that's too, I can't do it myself. I can, I, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to make up a theory. In fact, when, when we began COT, I remember Angie and I, this was like two and a half years ago, I think, but I told Angie, when Joe Hagman, I don't do theories. I, I can't do theories. I just let them know up front. I'm, I can't do theories. I can't because when people believe in a theory and it's wrong, that blood's going to be on my hands. Not theirs, mine. My hands. I'm not going to be responsible for doing Satan's work for him. Some theories could be absolutely right. I personally, I can't take that chance. I'm not going to take that chance. I can't do it. I'm not that bold. So I'm truly a donkey. That's why I refer to myself as a donkey. Donkeys don't have theories. They just simply repeat what they heard. That's what I'm doing, repeating what I heard. At any rate, these storms, you know what? I'll tell you what's going to happen to these storms. They're going to subside. Then a massive heat is going to flow. Then winter's going to be out of place. And then it's all going to break loose from there. Did you guys get that? I won't say that twice. I won't say it again. To talk about certain weather things now, it's quite dangerous. Quite dangerous. There are a lot of people who are going to believe that the seasons are out of place, that the pole shift is, you know, there are a lot of people who are going to believe the pole shift is taking place. To track a pole shift, you must track the sun. You have to track the sun. But I submit to you this. What's going to mess people up is when there is no pole shift and the seasons change anyway. I would like to have people prepared. I tend to entertain those subjects that people don't think of or say they don't exist, like the jet stream changing direction. When the jet stream changes direction, does anybody have any idea what's going to happen to the western portion of the United States? What's going to happen to Europe? You guys have any idea? Nobody is prepared for the jet stream to change positions. Yeah, how you doing, Brother Jesse? And it sure will. A drought beyond comprehension. By the way, it's happened before, you all. The jet stream did change positions once before, very briefly. This was in the uh, uh, 80s, I believe. Very briefly, it changed positions and caused the worst drought In the history of histories, this influence we're under is going to change it for a great many days. Certain places in the United States will be a wasteland. Those places that were temperate forests, like the East Coast, Virginia, West Virginia, part of Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, those places. They're going to become arid regions. Coastal places, the East Coast is going to be hammered if the jet stream changes position. You're looking at a lot of moisture, a lot of moisture coming from the North Atlantic Ocean, which normally goes to Europe, coming back to the East Coast. And because of the mountain ranges on the East Coast, it's going to get trapped. It will cause us to lose a lot of coastal places on the East Coast. Saturation effect will take its toll. 
because there are empty caverns all up and down the East Coast. And you know what? Heidi broke that because she said the Lord gave her the word wormhole concerning the East Coast. And I don't think she has any earthly idea that what she was talking about is classified information concerning the East Coast. If saturation affects too much rain hits the East Coast, we're going to lose Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, parts of Georgia, the Florida, parts of Florida will be gone. New Jersey will be gone. Rhode Island, Massachusetts will be hit. Parts of Maine will begin to go under. That's what happens if the jet stream changes for any duration of days. Everybody's going to have to migrate who are east of the Appalachian Mountains to places like Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, and Wisconsin. That's what they're going to have to do. Those folks who live in Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, California, Utah, New Mexico, and Texas. We're going to have to migrate to places like North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas. And then a great number of people are going to attempt to flee south across the border. You guys know that statement, you reap what you sow. What do you think is going to happen when the highways get jammed going into Mexico because people are fleeing? What do you think is going to happen? That's a question mark day. That's a question mark day. When they have to flee to Mexico to escape what's here in the United States, can you imagine what's going to happen? Canada won't be any good to flee because Canada will be overtaken by the coldest temperatures on record. By the way, there was an ancient freeze. And I think they got the time down to 14 minutes. 14 minutes. 14 minutes. Just think, you're going in the middle of July. It's summer, you're having a barbecue. 14 minutes later, everything is frozen in about six inches of ice. Can you imagine that? That's how long it took last time, 14 minutes. A great many people were warned about that time and they went underground. That's what happened to them. Anyway, we're not getting into that history. Not yet, not yet. But to convey a reality of something in Revelation, those unthinkable things in Revelation that a great many people have no clue about yet. This is why I don't put limitations on knowledge. I'm never going to be the one to say this or that cannot happen. I won't say that. This is why I don't get into debates about doctrine and theories. I simply don't get into debates about it. Because I'm not going to be the one that says this or that cannot happen. I hear a great many people talking about vortexes and portals. You hear them talking about portals. One of the interesting things about portals is that they're opening the big one in July. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. The big one, they have the small ones that are natural portals. The big one will in fact feed a control type energy to the, all the remaining ones on Earth. You see, they're all interconnected, but they're interconnected in an external dimension. So, the one that's right there at the facility, once they take control of that one, they control all of them. And then everything from every different dimension they have access to can pour into right through the gates. They've been here before, by the way. They've been documented. All the areas of which they use on their timing are watch my armed guards. They watch each and every portal. If a person goes into a portal and they vanish, they'll never let them come back through. They normally kill them before they come back through. Just to let you know that. 
Of course, some people don't come back through in whole pieces. When the veil's lifted, there will, there will be no partition between the spiritual realm or that dimension and this dimension. That's going to be gone. You have to remember, fallen angels and demons cannot do it themselves, so they use us to perform the work for them. This is why a massive, this is why a great many people are targeted for possession. They need to carry out what they need to carry out. That only happens under possession. Now, I submit to you now, a great many people are possessed. But the demons are hiding themselves so that the Christians never recognize they are possessed. And the more people who fall away from the faith. See, when you fall away from the faith, the Holy Spirit no longer dwells with you. Your authority is stripped away from you. The more authority that is stripped away from human beings who believe in Jesus Christ, the more the demonic entities can operate. They can operate with you in the way. They will avoid you at all costs because they know they are subject unto you through the name of Jesus Christ. That's why that man of perdition will never be revealed until there be a great falling away first. He wouldn't make it. There has to be a great falling away first. Satan himself could not make it in an environment where there are too many believers. He would have no support system. His army couldn't even raise. But they're hiding from you like a serpent does. They slither in the shadows where you can't see them. This is what they're doing. That bale will be taken down. It will. So you see the importance of staying on the walk with the prescribed way of life that Jesus gave us. I noticed that Jesus, he really explained to us the way to go. But a great many people won't listen. They won't miss. Well, Lisa, that's the problem for FEMA and the CDC. Now you got to ask yourself this. Why would FEMA and the CDC be worried about massive possession? Why? But they are. In fact, they're getting some case. They've been getting a few cases for the last five years that make zero sense. How can a person go from healthy to almost deteriorating, back to healthy again, then deterioration, then back to healthy, and that's impossible. That's a very nasty one they had in them. There are a lot of people, and they do monitor the number of people who perform witchcraft, and the numbers are growing, and they're growing. People are doing little spells. They're harnessing demonic power. You see, it's important that we, that's why, you know what, Lisa, during our talks, I always tell everybody, don't play with your salvation. Don't toy with your salvation. For people who think it's a game, they're going to find out a very harsh lesson, an eternal lesson. You cannot play with your salvation. Now, there's no need for fear because you're given power over all these things. Remember that. You're given power over all these things are subject unto you through the power, through that name of Jesus Christ of which you have authority to use. They're subject unto you through the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, don't get all happy. Don't get all happy about that. But be happy that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. See, if your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life, they have no power over you. That's why it was written that all those written in the Lamb's Book of Life will not worship the beast. At that time, there are going to be two ways out of the whole thing. But we can't toy with our salvation. Notice your salvation is a helmet. If you lose your head, the rest of the army no longer matters. It doesn't matter. The attacks right now are against your salvation. Doctrines are being um, distributed throughout the world, told by many people saying there's another way. There is no other way. 
They're trying to avoid the blood of the lamb. They're changing the message of Christianity. This is happening before our very eyes. They're scoffing and mocking the miracles of Jesus Christ, saying that they're scientifically can be proven and so forth. They want to take the power away from Jesus Christ so that people do fall away. This is to achieve their end game, to have that veil taken down. And as we know it, Apollyon comes with the key to the bottomless pit and begins a process that won't be undone. There's another story about Apollyon, how he resides on a planet, a planet that is super dark. That's his dwelling place. He is the angel of destruction. Apollyon is used by God himself. Apollyon is the commander of one of God's armies for that destruction reserved for time. Apollyon does not belong to Satan so much as he's under command of God himself. That's why Apollyon is sent to earth with the key to the bottomless pit. A lot of people are going to find out that Tartarus is not simply a word or mythical place, but it's a real place. You see, what a great many people have forgotten is that the Lord created all things, and all things are still subject unto him. If he sends them, he sends them. Notice that he gave it, he told Apollyon to release the bottomless pit, but he told those things. They can hurt anything except the green stuff, and they cannot touch anybody with the seal of God on their foreheads. You see, they were under God's command the whole time. Their commander unleashed them, gave them instruction. They carried out those instructions, and it said that in those days, men will seek death and will not find it, that death will flee from them. And everybody who does not have the seal of God on their foreheads, which are the 144,000, will know what pain is. Because they will have pain five months. But we don't know how long they were on earth. We just know that they had the power to torment men for five months when they were stung. Or pierced. And it said that men would seek death, but death would flee from them. But these things are coming, which is why we can't play with our salvation. You know, at least I'm not going to speculate about the 144,000, but listen, 144,000 was sealed from the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Also spoke about the 144,000 again and explained who they were. In Revelation 14. In fact, it says, These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. That's what we know about them. And in their mouth was found no guile. They are without fault before the throne. That's what we know about them. Yes, and yes, exactly what it says. Apollyon has the key to the bottomless pit. Here's what's funny about that. Now, I know a lot of people don't believe Revelation is in order, but again, I have to read it like it was given to me. But when the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was spent, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars also, so that a third part of them didn't show that, you know what? Can you imagine? That's like a, that's like a black, black object obstructing the vision we have here on earth from the sky the moon because see in order to black out a third of the sky something has to be between earth or very close to earth which would blot out a third of the sky and right after something blots out a third of the sky Apollyon comes isn't that something in fact, it says, when the fifth angel sounded, he saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pits. 
And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose smoke out of the pit, as smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now this also corresponds to Joel. Yep, we can also read, listen, listen, in verse 11, chapter 9, verse 11, and it says, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. You get that? Apollyon, chapter 9, verse 11. Apollyon has a key to the bottomless pit. He commanded that army that came out of the pit. He's the same angel that lay hold of the dragon and bound him up. Isn't that something? His name is Apollyon. See, there's only one angel that has a key to the bottomless pit. He's mentioned in Revelation 20. And, of course, Revelation 9. Yeah, it's very interesting. The same angel commands God's army. He also bound, he bound up the great dragon, Lucifer, Satan. He's under God's orders. This is why when we read in Joel and we see these same things coming out of the pit and the smoke, that the sky is darkened by reason of the smoke, but the Lord said he uttered his voice before his army. This is God's army. And he specifically told them not to touch any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. That's what he told them. That's something you would tell an insect. I'll say it again. Apollyon, in the Greek tongue, or Abaddon, in the Hebrew tongue, is the angel with the key to the bottomless pit. In Revelation 20, the same angel with the key to the bottomless pit bound the serpent to the great dragon, that old dragon called the devil, Lucifer, the ancient one. He, by the way, is the fourth dragon in existence. All the rest are locked up except one, that's Lucifer. You guys made me talk for this long and I didn't take a break. You should be ashamed of yourselves. I'm going to take a break and I'll be right back. Yep, you guys got me good this time. You got me good this time because my motor mouth began and I couldn't stop. Jesse, it's good to see you here again. Good to see you here again. I forgot, lost my place and everything. Where was I? Folks, I was looking at the... Uh, Watching the uh, weather maps and how these storms form out of nothingness. And uh, the pattern seems to indicate a wall forming of all things. A wall. A wall is forming. The, well, the, first of all, the moisture forming out of nowhere makes no sense. Because it's going over drought regions which are very dry but the moisture is forming after that i hope you know that that's uh, an unlikely scenario that's happening so the weather we're having is one of those scenarios that is not uh, common at all and again they're going to have to think up new names for some of the new type tornadoes horizontal tornadoes that will form which are going to be Imagine a wall of cloud, a wall of cloud that looks like a tsunami or a very high wave coming at you, but it's full of moisture and winds, very high winds. You see, a horizontal tornado, if it formed, would have pressures and wind beyond anything anybody on earth that I know of has experienced. But we really are looking at winds being very close to, well, let's just say 400 miles an hour plus. 400 mile an hour plus. Peter, there was 
uh, there were some isolated happenings. Isolated. But this one indicated that the other one's taking that same track. <sighs> or, or more like perturbers. There will be perturbations in this solar system. We're going to pass right through an ancient system. That's what they've been hiding. So we're going to pass right through an ancient solar system. Anyway, I won't say that again either. So just keep that one to yourselves. That's not very safe to say. What we do know is that our shields are down. Okay, patch balls online. Yeah, by the way, those, they're, they're, listen, there are four magnetic type balls in this solar system. They have not moved. There's a fifth inside the sun that goes inside, outside, inside, outside. They have not moved. But again, we are passing through an ancient, when we pass through that ancient solar system, now that's going to be trouble. All right, folks, we're going to, we're going to swap to Pastor Paul here. He's supposed to be on at 7.30, not 7 o'clock. 7.30. Is he on live? Yeah, he is. No, is this a rerun or is this live? Somebody find out if this is a rerun, please, or live. Might be live. Yeah, from inside and outside the sun. Actually, I'm shocked that Jesse didn't pick this up, but they keep removing frames on the activity of the sun. So it's they're they're really scrutinizing everything concerning the sun because now there are frames missing and they're editing all the happenings. They're doing real time editing and a host of things, and so. I mean, if I have to, I, I want to give, I want to give certain people set access to optics that do not um, go through that filtering process that will give them the missing frames. But still, it's only, you know what, it's only good through information because it can't be verified by anybody else. And that's the problem with our society today. They have to have everything verified. Yeah, Peter, when we were watching live and that small dot was in the back, remember, it was live. And I said, oops, somebody's going to be in trouble because that small dot's in the back of the ISS. Then, of course, the feed was lost. Do you remember that, Peter? I think, Peter, you uh, you showed us a link to that page. But I had been seeing that small dot in the back and they're not allowed to show that. Here's how it works, by the way. Here's how it works. What they do is they'll take an image, an external image they will defocus that external image so everything seems blurred. Then they have another camera that takes another image and they effectively blank out any of their targeted colors from the background. Then they put the two pictures back together and thus you don't see anything in the background because here's the truth. If you were to actually go into space, there's not a spot you can look, there wouldn't be a star. You'd see stars everywhere. There's not a spot in the sky you could point to where you wouldn't see a star. In the night sky, the atmosphere filters out a great many of the stars. Now just imagine that. From your viewpoint on Earth, you're seeing just a few stars. But if the atmosphere vanishes, you would see so many stars and so many objects moving and very large things moving. Yet it probably scare you to pieces. There are large triangle vessels that move often throughout the solar system. They don't want you to know any of these things. Can you imagine a triangle sized object that we did not build? That's larger than the moon moving around in the solar system. How about what they call the space arcs that we didn't build that are 600 miles in length, 300 miles in width, and about 250 miles tall. 
highly radioactive that are moving throughout our universe all the time. Men have lied so much covering up things that if they were ever, listen, when these things begin to unfold, people are really going to have heart attacks. That's why they're going to have heart attacks. This is why I'm telling you guys, don't, don't ever say what does not exist. Don't be in that crowd. Believe the word of God. Wait till he gives revelation. Because we, people are going to visually see things that are only found, you know, in sci-fi stories. Don't be one of those who says this doesn't exist and that doesn't exist. Don't do that to yourself. Please don't do that to yourself. The Bible did say men's hearts will fail them for fear for what is coming upon the earth. If they said a hurricane was coming, I don't think that would give anybody a heart attack. You know what would give them a heart attack? If they saw something coming that they couldn't possibly imagine and they had proof it was coming. That would give them a heart attack. There are a great many mysteries to the public in this world. And in my opinion, some should remain mysteries. Some should remain. But the others that are in the Bible should be told. They should be told because a great many people are not going to believe what's happening. There are certain entities of old that are now showing up. Just now, they're showing back up again. Of course, we've had guardians and watchers. Did you guys know the first set of watchers fell? They're called watchers because they intercede for man on earth. They stop things unlawful from happening to earth, but they were replaced. So we have a whole new set. But there are other things showing up too. The earth has built-in defense mechanisms and weapons that are coming back online all by themselves. They only come online in the presence of trouble. To be honest with you, in the Tunguska blast, they determined that one of those weapons fired. They know it fired. They know that one of those weapons fired over Russia too. There's a place in Russia that has domes that are highly radioactive that have been there for a very long time. The metal is made, the metal is something that's not found on earth, but they're perfectly made. When I say perfect, I mean perfectly made. They exist in Russia, but they'll make you sick getting near them. They're very old. This is something we didn't build. This is something built pre-flood time, pre-flood. They also don't want you to know that the years before the flood were a little more advanced than the days we have now. They don't want you to know that. The basis of their technology was not proton and electron theory, but they harnessed energy in other ways. They had flying machines. King Solomon himself, in one day, flew to an, a whole other nation. They don't want to tell you about Noah's sons leaving inscriptions in Mexico. One of his sons leaving that. They don't want to tell you that they were masters of metal work. They certainly don't want to show you the tools that they had that included some crystalline laser technology. They don't want to tell you that. They don't want to tell you that underneath the Great Pyramid in Egypt, that something had, is turned on down there. They don't want to tell you that. They certainly don't want to tell you about the prosthetics that they find in dinosaurs often. They don't want to tell you that either. There are a great many things people don't know. That's why you shouldn't say what does not exist. You know whose hearts are going to fail them for fear for what is coming upon the earth? The scoffers. The scoffers are. See, a scoffer will say, oh, I've seen so much of the Bible, I don't believe it. it, that can't be true, that's just garbage. That's a scoffer. A scoffer was once on the inside and then fell away. That's why they're, they make the best scoffers. You see, a person that doesn't know what they're talking about, they don't really scoff so well, do they? 
but one that's been on the inside, they scoff. These same people are going to realize that the words of Revelation were true, that the prophecies were true, and they're going to know they're condemned. And when these things show up, that's it. They're going to have a heart attack because now they have to answer for it. In fact, the book of Isaiah says a great many people will walk with their head down, not even asking for forgiveness because they're going to know internally they're guilty. It was promised that there would be a great war in heaven. A great war in heaven right before the beast is sent to earth. There'll be a great war in heaven. A lot of people think that war is happening or happened already. I can say now they don't know what they're talking about. Because they don't know about K. Surat. The great winged dragon who can travel dimensions when he wants to. They're talking about Lucifer, who is also called the king of this world, who by appointment must meet every single president on a second term. You know what's funny? He meets every president on his second term. Not the first, the second. But then it's always funny on the second term, all presidents, their hair turns gray. They seem to look worn. The life is sucked out of them. Have you guys noticed that? Not their first, their second term. Am I the only one that notices this? Or have you guys noticed it too? On their second term, it's as though they lost 10 years of their life. 10 years. So, is it me or is Pastor in the, in the, uh, oh, he was on his computer. I have his face pulled up and he just invaded the screen. Poof. Anyway, these are things that most people don't know about. They don't know about. But what do you do? To those of you who do know, You'll find yourself hard-pressed to convince anybody. We're not here to convince anybody of anything. We're here to let them know there's power in the cross. There's still time for salvation. We are here to edify one another. To lift each other up. You see, if I happen to get weak or drift into an area, I do expect one of you to find it. Say, hey, go back. Go back to where you were. I'll say, oh, thanks. It's like falling asleep at the wheel. If you fall asleep at the wheel, wouldn't you like your cold driver to smack you with something so you get back on the road? Or is your cold driver going to let you go to sleep and then both of you crash? Right? We're here to identify one another. But there are a great many happenings about to take place on this sort of thing. You know what? I'm finding it difficult to, to uh, describe to you. Certain things I know about, I keep them to myself. They're, they're so out of the realm of possibility that your perception could not, your mental state could not handle it. Not yet. I'm waiting on some type of a small demonstration so I can go further. Just as we learn the word of God precept upon precept, there are precepts that need to be founded first before I can tell you about other things. Right before the demonstration. I know a demonstration is coming. It's already on its way. It's being tracked and it will be here soon enough. And everything in the world is changing right now. Things are waking up that have been dormant for 10,000 years and they're waking up. Devices are turning on, causing vibrations, strange vibrations. Atmospheric compression was one of the first signs mentioned in a very ancient set of, uh, well, you could call them computer systems. The same signs that appeared back then are appearing right now. But we're going to see a great many things. You'll see the heavens open up. You'll see a dimensional fold. You'll know what that looks like. You'll see what pours out over the earth. When it says the stars of heaven will fall to earth, here's, here's something you've got to realize. Listen, whenever the Bible gives no impact 
from the stars falling to the earth? They're entities, not actual stars. You see, because when hail, fire, mingled with blood was cast into the earth, we saw the result of that. All the grass was burned up, one third of the trees. When a great mountain burning as fire was cast into the sea, we saw the result of that. Third part of the creatures which were in sea, they had like die, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. Wormwood also. But see, when the sixth seal was open, and the stars fell to earth, like untimely fates, when she is shaken by a mighty wind, there was no resulting impact on earth. The only thing that was given at that same time was a sky rolled together as a scroll. It appears that that sky rolling together as a scroll could be that dimensional fold in which these entities come right into this dimension. See, right now they've been limited to dreams and to vessels. Dreams and vessels. One day they'll come in through a dimensional fold, likely, likely, through CERN's success. CERN has never run at 100%. Last time they started up CERN and it went to a pretty high level. Everybody around there reported paranormal activity. Giants, there were deaths involved. People were half eaten. It was horrible. This was last time they did this. They kept most of it out of the newspaper. I think it startled everybody. And even took me by surprise to find out that there were bodies missing. Half of their bodies. Limbs were bit off with teeth marks and everything else. No, it wasn't a good thing. But they're going to do it again at 100%. And when they do it at 100%, it's a chance that all of them might do it. But there are a great many people disturbed after that. And if a dimensional fold happens, those things in that realm will come to earth. Maybe that's why the rich men hid themselves in the mountains and the caves. Why else would they hide themselves? Why else? Why would the leaders of this world hide themselves in the caves, yet everybody else topside continues to live. Why would they do this? Something really bad came on the earth. And they hid themselves. They were caught by surprise. Thank God that he says immediately after the tribulation of those days, this happens. But still, we don't get out of tribulation. We'll come out of tribulation. We're going to experience that. And again, the rapture was given by somebody who was on a horse, fell off the horse, hit his head on a rock, and, and, and falsely predicted the rapture five times before he died. So there will be things that will happen. And if you're sensitive to the spirit, you'll feel the spiritual pressure. You're going to feel it. You'll feel it. Be ready for it. Don't be a scoffer in your own right saying these things can never happen. Don't say that. Don't put limitations on what the Father has reserved for himself. We're children, speculators. We are but children. I have a greater insight of what could happen. You need, I won't even say what does not exist. I was broken from that very early in life. I'm not going to say what does not exist. I know one thing, nothing can touch me. So long as I rest in the salvation of the Lord. I can't be touched. These things can't touch me. They can't touch you either. But there will be a great falling away so that all these things can happen. Let me give you something else that uh, a lot of people do believe that spiritual Israel has become the whole earth. But listen, Jesus said those in Judea flee to the mountains. Did he not? In Revelation, it said the holy city will be trampled underfoot for 42 months. Did he not? Again, I, I just want to tell you this. That a lot of people before the Holocaust 
talked about the same subject, and then the Holocaust happened. What is so, what can be irritating is how fast we forget. We forget things. People did not, they, we just forget. Those are stories that should be told based on the Word of God and, and how people believed in the Word. Not mistakes in the Word of God, but the mistakes that we made interpreting the Word of God. That should be documented. They made a mistake in the Holocaust, and the Bible said they would. They would not write a divine the times. They wouldn't do it. And they suffered. They suffered because they didn't know the season, but it was prophesied. There was nothing they could do about it. Now we're looking at another prophecy, Revelation. It's prophesied. There's nothing anybody can do about it. We can certainly speed it up, but we can't do anything about it. It's coming. That's why your helmet is the most precious piece of armor that you have. I would rather be, I would rather lose an arm than to lose my helmet. I would rather my hand be chopped off than to lose my helmet. I would rather an eye be plucked out, a tongue chopped out, than to lose my helmet. If you lose your helmet, none of the rest of your armor works. It won't work. And the helmet is the helmet of salvation. Now, what does that tell you, though, folks, concerning your armor? What does that tell you? The helmet is your helmet of salvation. What does that tell you? What is the enemy aiming at? What is his ultimate goal? What is the enemy's ultimate goal? Now, you're wearing the helmet of salvation when the head is the most precious part of your body. What is the enemy aiming at? Keep that in mind. The enemy wants your soul, not your death. See, if you died right now, you go to be with the Father. That's not what he wants. He wants your soul. He wants you to turn against God. He wants you to fall away. All these strange doctrines out here, they're formulated to fight in your mind. The battlefield is in your mind. The greater part of the battlefield is your mind. This is why we shouldn't get into conversation arguing about different aspects of doctrine. But we should say, Jesus is Lord. We should edify that fact. Edify one another to say, listen, you're washed in the blood of the Lamb. The Lord will change your garments. Follow him. Be renewed. You're a new creature in Christ. For those who are stuck on old doctrine, say, hey, stop. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Stop looking at old doctrine. The old way you did does not work. And you know what is so funny? Because when you begin to follow the Lord, you have peace in your soul. Everything around you begins to change. Authority shifts. You begin to worship him more. Even when you're sitting in the fire, you're never burnt. Strange doctrine has a different effect. You're tossed like the waves. You will run to and fro to different doctrine. And you'll never, ever investigate the gospel of truth for yourself. Satan is after your head. Keep your helmets on. He's got his weapon already perched. He has it positioned. He's ready to fire as soon as you take your helmet off. Only you can remove your helmet. He can only whisper to you to say, hey, take your helmet off for a few minutes. That's all I can do. That's how Satan works. If I could leave you anything, anything, any last statement, it would be, don't ever lose your helmet. This thing, you'll be in real trouble. And nothing else is going to matter once you lose your helmet. Nothing else. Yeah, Lisa, people can um, 
Listen, if, if you're, a demon cannot inhabit a temple of which the Holy Spirit inhabits, first thing, right? But there are a great many people who can walk around in life and not know they're inhabited by a demon because they don't belong to Jesus Christ yet. They don't. They don't belong to Jesus Christ, and anything can come in that house and take it over. That's why when the Lord said this, the Lord said this, the Lord said, if you cast out a demon, the demons are cast out, but they come back finding the house swept clean. That means no one's occupying that house. They'll go out and get seven more worse than they were to go retake that house again. The lesson in that was this. Once a demon leaves, that vessel, that person, must be instantly occupied by the Holy Spirit, or they're going to be inhabited again by another demon, and seven more worse than the first one was. That's what happened. See, when a demon is cast out, it's important that we immediately minister to that person. And the Lord knows this. A demon can be cast out, but that person has to give his or her life to the Lord. They have to believe that Jesus is the Savior. They have to be occupied by the Holy Spirit so that nothing else can occupy that place. If you belong to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, nothing can occupy you. But be warned, they will whisper in your ear. They will enter other people and talk to you. They will. Folks, I love you. I have got to run briefly, real quick. I may be back, but as I understand it, Brother Marcus is going to be on. So, uh, Brother Marcus and, and of course, uh, Pastor Paul is going to be on too. So, folks, I love you. I'll be back in the chat room here in a minute or two. God bless.